I'm just glad to be back with you today. Wow, a lot of changes have taken place since I was last here. In fact, the last time I was here, this, this building was just a shell. And, uh, and I just, uh, wow, I'm, I'm amazed. I said, uh, Brother Jeff, I, I said, uh, when I see all these people, I think, where in the world did you put them when you were in that building? So, uh, and, I, and I know probably on coat hangers and all sorts of stuff. But uh, it's, it's just great to see uh, what the Lord's doing. And, and I've been blessed already uh, just by people coming in and, and people stirring around. And, and uh, one of the worst things you can hear in, in a church is silence. Yeah. And uh, whenever there's uh, uh, people stirring around and they're being blessed, it's, uh, it's just a real encouragement. And so I, I've enjoyed it. And seeing all of you, many of you, uh, I, uh, Remember, and some of you I met for the first time. So, uh, God bless you, and Brother Jeff, thank you for asking me to come back. And, uh, wow, what uh, what great music. Uh, I tell you, when the music's as good as this, Preacher Lays and Egg, it's still been worth coming to church. Amen. <laughs> so, uh, any, if I say anything that's worth remembering, this is just a, an added bonus. It was just, uh, wow. Uh, that one of the courses you did, I, I've never heard before. That, that was just everything, and then. And then Melissa, of course, I, I, I hope that my wife had a little part in Melissa and her. Uh, boy, she can sing a song. And this sanctified band, I, I like that too. I mean, that was, that, that was good. And uh, it's just uh, out, out, outstanding. I do hope you have your Bibles. Uh, Revelation 22, 17 is where we're going to be reading in, in a few minutes. I, I call this message God's Last Invitation because it is. Um, I do not believe that the, that the Bible contains the Word of God. I believe that it is the Word of God. Right? And I believe that everything that God wants us to know about Him is found in the pages of, of this book. Uh, I'm old enough to remember some of the old time preachers. Uh, one was uh, W.A. Criswell. For over 50 years, he was the pastor of the First Baptist Church of Dallas, Texas. And he's a great preacher. I mean, he just preach the stars down when he preach. And I remember hearing him say one time, he held up his Bible and he says, this is a hymn book. Everybody looked at him and said, it's all about Amen. And uh, that, uh, that blesses me because it is, it's all about Jesus. From the first word of Genesis to the last word of Revelation, it's revealing the Lord Jesus Christ to us. And it's the will of God that we come to know the Lord Jesus Christ personally uh, as our Savior. So you'll find Jesus all through the pages of the Bible. And one of the things that uh, has really caught my attention in the last uh, couple of years is the fact that God, uh, all through the Bible, gives invitations for people to come and get in on His life. To come and get in, in on His abundant life. For Jesus said, I am coming that they might have life and they might have it more abundantly. And for God to give us the invitation to come and get in on His eternal life. You see, every one of us are eternal beings. Wow. A million years from now, we're all going to be alive. And we have the opportunity to choose where we're going to live forever. Wow. Either in heaven or in hell. And quite frankly, a long time ago I decided that heaven looked a lot better than hell. So I, that's one of the reasons I got saved. I know that's still a good reason to get saved. Amen. Fifty years ago, I said yes to Jesus, and thank God that I did. I took Him up on His invitation. Now, uh, I'll read in just a few moments His last invitation, but you know what I found out? It's not much different from His first invitation. If you may recall the story of, uh, of, uh, of uh, Noah and the flood. And the Bible tells us that God told Noah that he was going to send a flood and going to destroy the earth. But God told Noah to build an ark. And he gave them the, the instructions and the specifications as to how long it was going to be, how wide it was going to be, how high it was going to be. And I'll guarantee you when the rain started falling and the, and the waters were rising and Noah and his family were inside the ark, he was glad that he did it God's way. Yeah. My friends, when the storms of life come and you said yes to the Lord and you've done it His way, I promise you, you'll be glad you've done it His way right now too. Yeah. But before the flood started, Noah, when he finished the ark, and the, the Bible tells us that he did 120 years, and then when he finished, 
God does, gives a, an invitation in Genesis 7 verse 1. He says, come thou into the ark. And you know what? God gave that invitation. Everybody could have taken him up on it, but uh, it was only Noah and his wife and his three sons and their wives. And they went into the ark, the place of safety. And whenever God called the animals from the four corners of the earth, and they went in there, and the Bible tells us that the Lord shut it in. And some time passed, and then the rains, as I said, started falling. And the waters were gushing up from beneath their feet through the ground. And the Bible says that 40 days and 40 nights it rained, and not a single person on the outside of the ark lived. All of them died. But Noah and his wife, three sons and their wives, eight people were safe and sound because they took God up on his invitation. Very simple invitation. Come into the ark. I'm glad, by the way, that God didn't say go. You know why? Because if uh, Brother Jeff had, had called me this morning and said, Now, Terry, we're looking for you, so come. You know what I'd say? Well, Brother Jeff's already there. Now, if he said, Well, you need to go to the church, I'd think, Well, where are you? I'm glad that God didn't say go into the ark, but I'm glad he said come. That let Noah know he was already inside yeah, right. the ark. Yeah. My friends, whenever Noah walked about to bless myself, when Noah got into the ark, he found an almighty God waiting for him, able and capable to supply every need that he would have in all of his life. I'm glad Noah took God up on his first right. invitation. Did you, did you find invitations again from God throughout the Old Testament? Isaiah 118, God gives an invitation. He says, come now and let us reason together. Though your sins be as scarlet, they shall be as white as snow. Though they be red like crimson, they shall be as wool. And you know what? For every person that's taken God up on that invitation to come and have his sins forgiven, everyone I've ever met, they've always told me, Terry, I'm glad I did. In fact, I've never met a person, Brother Jeff, in 40 years of preaching, I've never met a one that said that I'm a Christian, but I, never, I wish I'd never become a Christian. Mm -hmm. I've never met a one. I met a lot of folks that said, I wish I hadn't waited so long. Amen. I wish I hadn't put it off. I wish I hadn't postponed it. But everyone, by, by the way, I've met a lot of satisfied customers when it comes to Jesus. Amen. He still gives the invitation, come, come and have your sins forgiven. In the New Testament, I, 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 I recall uh, Luke 14, 17. It, it's a story, a parable. The Lord Jesus told parables sometimes. <laughs> A parable is an earthly story. We're told with a heavenly meaning. And the word parable means to bring alongside of and what Jesus would do. And did so wonderfully as He would take earthly stories and bring them alongside of heavenly truths so folks could understand it. And He said, I want to tell you what the kingdom of heaven is like. It's like a man that uh, made a great feast. And He sent out His servants at supper time. And He said, Come, for all things are now ready. You know what? The Bible tells us that the kingdom of heaven is when we come to know Jesus as our Savior. And I can glad to stand and say this morning, I can say like the servants did that were sent out from the rich man, come for all things are now ready. I can tell you this morning, I can say the same thing as far as God's salvation is concerned. Come for all things are now ready. Right. Wouldn't it be awful if I could, had to stand up and say, well, you know, if you want to have eternal life and you want to go to heaven, that's good. But everything's not quite yet been done that has to be. We, we have to make a, a few preparations. But my friends, when Jesus Christ was hanging on the cross and He said, it is finished. Oh, yeah. He said exactly the truth. Everything was done. Everything was completed that needed to be so yeah. that you <laughs> and me could have forgiveness for our sins. He says, it is finished. The way is made, and I can tell you this morning, come to Jesus. Yeah. All things are now yeah. ready. Yeah. Yeah. Then the last invitation. You didn't think I was going to get to it, did you? <laughs> Revelation 22, 17. It's so similar to the other invitations. It says, and the Spirit and the bride say, come. And let him that heareth say, come. And let him that is a thirst come. And whosoever will, let him take to the water of life freely. I, I like the way God 
puts things about being saved. He, he, he calls it here taking of the water of life. You see, getting saved is like taking a drink when you're thirsty. Getting saved is like eating a good meal when you're hungry. For Jesus I am the bread of life, and he that eats of my bread shall never get hungry again. Yeah. Getting saved is like going through a door. For Jesus said, I am the Lord. And if any man will enter in, he shall be saved. Getting saved, the Bible teaches, is like opening a door. For Jesus said, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if any man will open the door, I'll come in and eat with him and he with me. You see, God's made being saved so simple. And I wonder how many folks this morning, and I, I want to tell you, I, I realize I, I'm not preaching to the average crowd. I mean, you're blessed. Yeah. You have a, an unusual church. You have a wonderful church. I sense the presence of God when I walk in this morning. I, I, I sense the presence of God in the, in the lives of people. I, I see the, the smile of God on your faces. I see the peace of God in your eyes. I, I mean, it's, it's, this is a, it's an unusual place. It, it, it is a, an oasis in, in a dry and thirsty world, but I'll guarantee you there's probably some in this room you still have a thirsty soul. Yeah. Because you see, people are not Christians. They're not saved because they're around Christians. Right. They're not saved because they are among Christians. For you see, the Bible teaches that it's a personal thing. It's a personal relationship with a personal God. To say the Lord, to the Lord Jesus Christ, Lord Jesus, I've sinned and I'm sorry and I, I want to be saved and I believe you died on the cross for me. Come into my life and forgive my sins and save my soul. You see, a person has to say a personal yes to Jesus. You see, my, my, my dad was a preacher whenever I was growing up. I, I, every time I'm around your pastor, of course, I think about his dad. It, it, his dad, uh, Eddie, was one of the finest deacons I ever had. And uh, he was not only my, 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 one of my good deacons, but he was a, a bus driver deacon. And he was a tennis playing deacon. For he beat the stew out of me every time we go to those old tennis courts uh, uh, down, down between Dowtown and, and Liberty. And, and I thought, thought the world of, of, of Eddie. And, and whenever I think about Eddie, I think about my dad. Uh, my, my dad, I said, well, as I said, was a preacher for a while. And in fact, I, I have something on that that Jeff's never seen. This is my dad's class ring. Uh, he, he went to be with the Lord uh, a little over a year ago. And his twin brother, Hall, my dad was named Dole. We, we used to, kids said if there'd been a triplet, and they, they were twins, if there'd been a triplet, they'd named the third one Loon Fall. But, uh, <laughs> so I, I don't know if that's so or not. It's okay to make fun of your own family. So, uh, but uh, I am Terry Doyle, and, uh, and then Uncle Paul, not long ago, I, I was preaching at Cookville. He lives in Cookville, and, and uh, he came up to me and, and he cried in Dad's classroom. So I, I, I think about, about Dad and and I think about how when I would hear Dad preach and see Dad trust the Lord. And by the way, that's the best gift, Dad, Papa, you can give to your kids and to your grandkids. An example of somebody that loves Jesus. Amen. Now, it, it's wonderful to be a good provider. And that's and in fact, the Bible says those who won't provide for their own are worse than people that don't even believe in God. Yeah. But I want to tell you, it's, it's important that we're good providers. But the best thing you'll ever provide for your kids and your grandkids is for you to provide them with an the, the example of somebody that trusts God. Somebody that loves Jesus. Someone that's gave, given his life to the Lord. But you know, there was a time in my life when I had to make my dad's faith my own faith. And my dad was sitting next to me the day I got saved. In fact, they, normally I would sit on the front seat and and, uh, and I did all kinds of things before I got saved. <laughs> I would play dots, tic-tac-toe. Now, I wasn't 23 when I got saved. Okay, so I mean, I, I was eight, but so I, I didn't play dots and tic-tac-toe. And, and then I borrowed my dad's watch. He counted the seconds that the Baptist preacher preached. Four million, nine hundred thousand. At least that's what it seemed like. That's one thing that's not changed the Baptist church all those years. Uh, and I, I just really wasn't interested. But that day when I said yes to Jesus, God said, was dealing with my heart. And we're going to talk about God speaking to you in just a minute. We were singing, Pass me not on gentle Savior. 
hear my humble cry for all others that are calling do not pass me by. And I was sitting with Dad, and I, I'm, I'm having my head bowed. And I'm saying, Jesus, don't pass me by. Save me. And I'll never forget Dad looking down at me. He said, son, what's wrong with you? I said, I want to be saved. And I'll never forget, he was between me and the aisle. And he leaned back. And he said, go on. And you know what I did when he said go on? I went on. Man. And I took this foot. It's a little smaller then. And I took this foot and turned it toward the aisle. And you know when I made that first step toward the aisle, you know what happened to me? I got saved. Because when I made that first step, I trusted Jesus. Man. Now I got to the preacher eventually, but bless God, I got to Jesus before I got to the preacher. Amen. Amen. And jump off the Cumberland River Bridge, and he, God takes care of you. That saved me. He could have told me that. I'm confident he told me the right things. But thanks be to God that I had met Jesus back in the back before I got to the front, because that's when I trusted Him. And my friend, if you've never trusted Jesus as your Savior, that's what He wants you to do. With a faithful child, stop trying to figure it out. Stop trying to say, "I'm going to get." Good enough. You won't ever get good enough. Jesus has already made the way. Yeah, that's right. right. And you know what? There's a threefold invitation here in his last invitation. The Spirit and the bride say, Come, let him that hear us say, Come, let's deal with two and three, and then we'll close out with one, okay? It says, The bride says, Come. The Bible tells us that the bride of Christ are those of us who've been saved. Now, not just church members. You can't be a church member and miss heaven. Right. You can't be a church member and miss Jesus. And my, oh my, what a terrible short change it is for somebody to just get church and just get religion but never get Jesus. Right. But when you're really saved and you're part of the family of God and you're part of the bride of Christ, the Bible tells us the bridegroom, you know what? He's in heaven right now, seated at the right hand of the Father, and one of these days the bridegroom's going to come and get the bride. You and me. And, and, and you know, they tell us uh, in, uh, in uh, Eastern culture, it's, it's, uh, it's quite a bit different from, it is in, in culture like we grew up in and we live in. When uh, somebody gets engaged, you know, they stay together and they, they, they court, you know, and all kinds of stuff. But, but they tell us that when, when uh, a couple gets engaged, that what the bridegroom will do is he'll go to his father's house and he will uh, build a room for his bride. And he's building and building and building. And you know what? What he does, it is not his call to say when the room is ready. That's part of his father's house, but it's the father's call. So the father watches the son. And the son is building the room. And finally one day, maybe when the son least expected, the father says, son... The room's ready. Go get your bride. Right. You know what Jesus said? I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go to prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself. He's building a house for you and me that are saved that we can live in forever. And one of these days, the Lord's going to complete the house and the Father's going to say, Son, the room is ready. Go get your bride. Right. Yeah. Yeah. He will descend from heaven with a shout. And he'll, the cry from Revelation 4 1 will ring out, Come up here! And all of us who are saved will be caught away to meet Jesus in the clouds and be ushered into heaven. Amen. All of us who are saved, you know what? I can't explain it. But when you're saved yourself, you want other people to get saved too. Yeah. Right. You know, I worry about folks who claim to be saved that really don't want folks to get saved. Yeah. Unless it doesn't cramp their style. <laughs> you, you know, God help anybody get saved after 12 o'clock. Hello. <laughs> God, God help it if, if we run over. Right? God help if somebody get, get saved and, and I lose my parking space. Can I get a witness? <laughs> or surely nobody never better get saved and me lose my seat. <laughs> I mean, I, some of us could lose a whole lot of our seat. <laughs> I'd be better off. But uh, I, I, some folks.
folks, they, they just don't want people to get saved unless it's just convenient for them. But I worry about those folks. And some folks, when people get saved, and, and they're coming forward, and, and they just sit there. Myrtle, are they ever going to finish? <laughs> no, Claude, they're running over again. I get so tired of that stuff going with people coming forward. I get so tired of Brother Jeff in the back street. He will shrill up like a prune one of these days. I mean, why can't we go back to being like everybody else? Why, why can't we, you know, just calm down? We got more folks we can handle anyway. I mean, we, I worry about people like that. Come on. I want to tell you, when you get saved, that just something happens inside. You want other folks to get saved too. Hey. And I want to tell you, the best thing that ever happened to me since I got saved was seeing somebody else say yes to Jesus. Yeah. 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 And I tell you, when Brother Jeff called me yesterday, and I won't tell you where I was, but I was not around, you know, the, the church crowd, and he told me three people got saved. I about had a spell. <laughs> Three people got saved passing out Christmas gifts. Oh, yeah. Wow. Yeah. Well, Brother Terry, I believe that's a waste of time. You wouldn't if you got saved. Yeah. You wouldn't think it. My friends, folks are desperate. Folks are empty. Folks are looking. And they're looking in all the wrong places. And we know where to take them. Yeah. Because if you know Jesus, He has satisfied the longings of your heart. Yeah. And he has become the friend that sits closer than a brother. And he has become the one that you can go to when no, you can't go to anybody else. And the one that can do something about your problem when nobody else can. The bride says come. And I'll guarantee you, if you're not saved, every person in this building that's really saved, if you just listen to them, they're saying come. Come. Let him that heareth say come. That, that, that's, that's a little unusual. And it, our English language is not very descriptive. They, they tell us that, you know, the, the New Testament was originally written in Greek. And, and it's a lot more descriptive than our English language. So whenever the, if the translators took the Greek and took it into the English, some, some of the words, our English words, kind of lost the, the, the full meaning. And so they, there's some, some different uh, verbs in the New Testament that are continuous action verbs. So in the Greek, so whenever they wrote one of those continuous action verbs in the English, language tell us that what they did a lot of times is they put an E-T-H on the end of that word. It's like, uh, you, you remember the Sermon on the Mount, Matthew 5, 6, and 7? Asking it shall be given unto you, seeking you shall find, knocking it shall be opened unto you. For it says, for everyone that asketh, receiveth, and he that knocketh, it shall be opened, and he that seeketh, findeth. It's the same way. That means... You keep on asking. You keep on knocking. You keep on seeking. The Bible doesn't teach naming and claiming like some big people. Right. But you, you just keep on asking. You just keep on seeking. You just keep on knocking. So this word is the same word. He that heareth say come. That means that those who have heard over and over and over again say come and be saved. That lets me know that the ones who heard it the most love it the best. The old, old story never gets old, does it? You know, I, I almost get a revival in my heart just reading the Christmas story. Well, about to get one <coughs> this morning. About, 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 for sure about got it when they sang Mary, did you know? I, I'm often amazed that Mark Lowry could write such a wonderful song. He's an idiot, you know that? <laughs> I mean, he's a saved idiot. But just because you get saved, God may not cure idiot, you know that? <laughs> There's some folks that are saying they're still idiots. Can I get a witness? God don't cure anger. I mean, it. and when I see Mark Lowry on one of the gates of things, I say, he's still a nut. And then I go, Mary, did you know he wrote it? Oh, my goodness. That proves God takes imperfect people to do wonderful things. I almost had a revival. Read the Bible. The old, old story never gets old. And I find over the years, I'm still finding it now, is those who have known the Lord the longest and walked with Him the longest, it's even more precious as the time goes along. It gets sweeter and sweeter. The old preacher said sweeter and sweeter. 
gooder and gooder. And if it gets some getting bad, it probably turns to sugar. And it's just, mmm, mmm. Those who have heard over and over say come, then it says the Spirit says come. Now listen closely, and I'm going to close in just a minute. Brother Jeff, I'm glad that we're not in this work by ourselves. When you see the word Spirit in the Bible that is capitalized, that means the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is God in the world today. God the Father is seated on the throne in heaven. God the Son, Jesus Christ, is seated in His right hand. And God the Holy Spirit is in the world today. In fact, Jesus said to His disciples, that he was going to be crucified, he was going to die, and he was going to go away. And they said, we don't want you to go away. We, don't, we, we want you to stay with us. And he said, unless I go away, the Spirit will not come. The Holy Spirit will not come. But when I go away, I will send him. And you know what? That's exactly what Jesus did. Right. And when he went back to heaven, then he sent the Holy Spirit in the world. And the Holy Spirit does a whole lot of different things. He's God with us right now. He uh, speaks peace to our hearts. He teaches us things from the Word of God. He brings to our remembrance the things that Jesus has said. He, the, he is the comforter. He, it's just wonderful. But one of the things the Holy Spirit does is He invites people to come and be saved. He draws people to be saved. And you know what? I'm glad when I stand up to preach that it's not my job to convince somebody about Jesus. Because you know what? If a preacher could talk somebody into it, somebody else could talk them out of it. Yeah. But as the Word of God is being delivered, the Bible says the Word of God is the sword of the Spirit. And what the Holy Spirit does, the unseen hand of God, He takes the Word of God and He starts speaking to somebody's heart. And He lets them know. He personalizes it. He lets him know you need to be saved. You need to trust Jesus. Jesus loves you. He doesn't just love everybody. He loves you. He died for you. He arose from the dead for you. And He'll save you and come into your life and forgive all your past and give you a glorious future <coughs> if you'll trust Him. I cannot explain fully how it is when the Holy Spirit starts speaking in your heart. But I know it happened to me. Because instead of being able to play dots and tic-tac-toe and not really care, all of a sudden I realized, Terry, you're lost. You've sinned. You need to be saved. And listen, for me, that didn't, that didn't stop when I left church. <laughs> Because I didn't get saved the first time God spoke to my heart. I didn't. But you know what? It bothered me. It troubled me. And the old preacher would come and preach about Jesus coming again. And he'd scare me to death. Because I knew if Jesus came, I'd be left behind. I knew if Jesus came, I'd be lost. And the Holy Spirit was saying, Terry, come and be saved. Now, I've not seen a lot of places in this world, but they tell us they're pushing on to 7 billion people in the world now. That staggers my mind. But it's more amazing to me that God would know a little blonde-haired boy in Brush Creek, Tennessee, and that God the Holy Spirit would come by that church house that morning and speak to my heart again and say, Terry, Jesus will save you if you let him. Jesus is coming into your life if you let him. And you know what? I'm glad that morning I took him up on his invitation. And I said, yes. And it's sweeter right now than it's ever been in all my life. I wonder this morning, is God's Holy Spirit speaking to you? Have you been troubled about where you stand with God? Does it bother you about whether you go to heaven or not, if you were to die? Do you sense that there's more than you can hold in your hand? I wish I could tell you, like I said, I've been preaching almost 40 years. I wish I could tell you that everybody 
that I ever talked to about their souls said yes to Jesus. But that's just not so. I want to give you two quick stories, and this is it. First, the good story. When I was pastor of Round Lake Baptist Church in Watertown for almost seven and a half years, there were these uh, sweet ladies that came to our church, sisters, and uh, they lived together. In fact, the, the daughter never married and just stayed with her mama. But they were wonderful ladies. Well, they'd invite me and my wife over to eat supper, and they'd, make, they'd have 23 different bowls of different things. And it, it, they're just sweet people. I preached both their funerals. But um, one of them came to me one time, and she said, uh, Brother Terry said, the lady that fixes my hair every week, her husband is sick. In fact, they, doctors, doctors say he won't live much longer, and he's lost. Would you go and talk to him about his soul? I said, sure. She said, they have sent him home to die. And he's so weak, he can't even talk to me. But he knows what's going on. Will you just do the best you can? I said, sure, I'll do the best I can. And I'll never forget that afternoon, riding up in front of his house and walking up on his porch and seeing him lying there in a recliner, a, ch a chair. And I told him who I was, and he uh, acknowledged that he knew who I was. And, uh, and I just jumped right into it, and I told him Jesus loved him. And he died for him on the cross. And he was raised from the dead so he could be saved. And if he trusts him as his Savior, the Lord will save his soul and take him to heaven when he left this life. And I said, I realize you're weak and you really and you can't talk. But he said, I said, would you just take my hand and I'm going to pray. And as I pray, I'm going to share what you have to do to be saved with you again. And if you are willing to do that or you believe that, would you just squeeze my hand? when I do it. And he nodded a little. And I said, the Bible says that we've all sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. Do you believe you've sinned and displeased God in your life? He's pleased. I said, but the Bible tells us Jesus died on the cross, gave his blood to pay for our sins. When he died, he put him in a tomb. So we could be saved. Do you believe Jesus died on the cross for you and rose from the dead for you? And he squeezed. I said, if you'd be willing to ask the Lord to forgive you and save you, He will. Would you right now just place your faith and trust in Jesus Christ, asking the Lord to forgive you your sins and becoming your Savior? Would you ask the Lord to do that right now? And he squeezed again. And then I started to pray. Call the guy's name. I said, dear God, the best I know how, I've told this man how to be saved. The best I know how. He's acknowledged that he's trusted you. Jesus is his Savior. Now give him peace that everything's right with you. And when I finished, I said, have you peace in your heart? Have you peace in your heart since you asked Jesus to save you? And he squeezed it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. About two weeks later, he died. I was asked to do the funeral. But I could stand up and tell the whole crowd, families, friends, I'm confident that I'll see him in heaven. Well, he was too weak to say it. But he squeezed proper times to say, I trusted Jesus. Oh, I, I, I could give you a hundred, I could give you two hundred, five hundred stories. But I have to tell you about Rex. Rex was lost. He was a cousin of my best friend. My best friend said, Terry, Rex is lost. He's in Vanderbilt Hospital. He has a fast-moving form of cancer, and they say he's not going to live long, although he was just in his 40s. Would you go witness with him, with me, to him? We went down that Wednesday night after church. And I, I jumped right into it. I, I didn't feel like just trying to, you know, a lot of times when I try to witness to somebody, Brother Jeff, I'll try to give them the lightning first and then witness to them on the second time. 
And uh, but I really felt an urgency that night. And I showed him the whole thing just like I did the other man that got saved. And I said, won't you trust Jesus tonight, Rex, as you say here? And I'll never forget, his wife was across from on the other side of the bed. And he looked at her and he said, Deb, that's something we all do. But then he looked back at me and he said, but not today. I guess I really look sad. He said, but preacher, you will come back, won't you? You will come back and talk to me again, won't you? I said, sure, Vex. So his cousin, my friend, was down here at this end of the bed. I was here. His wife was here. And I prayed. A couple of days later, my friend, his cousin, called me and said, Terry Rex has slipped into a coma. Would you go back to the hospital with me? I said, sure. We went down there that night. I went to his bedside again. His wife was present again. My friend was present again, but Rex couldn't acknowledge us at all. And I just prayed and said, Dear God, I don't know if Rex can understand anything I'm saying. But Lord, if He can, please let Him know how much You love Him. Please let Him know that You'll save His soul if you'll just, He'll just let You. But when I finished, I felt such a hopeless sense. We went home on Saturday. I was walking through the hallway of the church. I was on staff at College Heights Baptist Church in Gallatin. And the phone rang. I took the key and opened the office door. College Heights Baptist Church. The lady at the other end of the line said, Can I speak to Reverend Wilkerson? I said, Speaking, how may I help you? She called Rex's name and said he passed away a few minutes ago. And the friend, the family asked me to try to get in touch with you. You're going to be contacted by the funeral directors there in Gallatin. They want you to do the funeral. You're the only preacher that he knew. I said, I'll be glad to do anything I can. The next morning, the funeral directors called me, and one week from the day that I heard Rex say, Deb, that's something we ought to do, but not today. I preached Rex's funeral. And I stood at the head of his casket and watched the grave diggers throw the spades full of dirt on his coffin. I said everything I knew to try to be an encouragement to the family. But all the while knowing, as far as people on this earth was concerned, as far as anybody knew, Rex died, lost, and went to hell. Oh, I pray that after I witnessed to him that he said yes to Jesus. But nobody knows if he did. He could have been saved, couldn't he? Just like if you're not saved, you can be saved. I want to ask you, will you do like that man who took Jesus up on his invitation? Or will you do like Rex? That's something I need to do. But not today. This, we're talking about your eternal soul. If I didn't know that I was saved, you know what I'd do? I'd get saved right now. Let's all bow our heads.